Well, Spencer, got some great guests in studio for the Sheriff's Sit Down this week and every week brought to you by Our Community Credit Union. Mason County Sheriff Casey Salisbury is here as well as Abe Gardner from Mason County Public Health. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you Good both morning. in here. And uh, what are we talking about today? Well, a couple things. And I'll let Abe take over. Um, you know, we've been talking about the uh, circumstances with people that are in uh, um, homeless issues. Yep. Uh, and, and then also people that are struggling with addiction issues and how uh, the mental health issues play into all that sometimes. And uh, we just had a meeting uh, last week, uh, you might have seen on, on the Facebook page, uh, with all of us in the area, law enforcement, fire, mental health workers, uh, people from the hospital working on that issue as our, as our countywide issue. Then this weekend, a, a number of people let me know about a commentary came out by Eric Johnson uh, called Seattle Dying. Yeah, I saw that on the internet. Here. And if you scope and scale that, we're not Seattle, but if you take a look at that, it, it, it causes you to ask yourself some questions about what are we doing in our community and how do we want to end up and where do we want to go from here. And I'm going to let Abe take over about the things that we've been working on in the community with our meeting the other day and and what side of the United States we're headed to here pretty quick. Yeah, Abe. Yeah, actually, yeah, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so uh, right now, uh, Mace County's got uh, a lot of people working on our substance use and opioid response plan. Um, and uh, last week's meeting was a, uh, a great representation of that. We have, uh, we have over 60 people sitting at the table, so we have the necessary people sitting at the table having the necessary conversations. Um, and in a rural community, in a smaller community, sometimes it's a little more difficult to uh, work in solution if everyone's working siloed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the most important part um, is the conversations and is the... Um, the community really working together so that we can pool our resources and that's kind of what's going on right now um, as the sheriff said there's a there's a show uh, indicating kind of what Seattle's running into and I think that's indicative of kind of nationwide as well as Mason County um, but we are working to try to get ahead of that as much as possible um, we've got uh, as I shared last time I was on the air here with you we have several programs in place um, Chief Bakken from North Mesa Rizzo Fire Authority uh, received some funding to implement a new program okay. that I think will really help solidify uh, the programs we do have. Um, they uh, they had spoken about uh, medic medication assisted treatment in uh, in jail and what that looks like, or in, uh, for folks that are incarcerated. It's a conversation we're having with uh, with the sheriff as well as Chief Hansen. So just to give you an idea about some numbers, so. Um, right now, folks that are incarcerated, up to 80 to 85 percent of people are dealing with the substance use, opioid use um, issue, uh, and often co-occurring a mental health uh, issue as well. Um, people that are re-entering after incarceration, um, based upon different studies, are usually 30 to 40 times more likely to die from an opioid overdose. So uh, we really think it's important to uh, provide as many services um, as possible, not just upon reentry, but while they're incarcerated mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and medication-assisted treatment has really uh, shown to be effective. Um, a person that's on medication-assisted treatment um, is uh, 40 to 50 percent less likely to die from an opioid overdose upon reentry into society. So um, we're not quite where we want to be, and Sheriff and I have talked about this, but uh, we're well on our way. Um, as I said, uh, necessary people are having the necessary conversations, and our uh, community is open to dialogue, open to education, and uh, we're excited about where we're headed. When it comes to uh, substance abuse and opioids, what are the main the the highest numbers of percentages of what folks are addicted to are there you know we've we've seen over the years there's been the meth uh problems that people have faced have those started to subside in a new <laughs> p batch of uh types of drugs or is everything still out there or what are the big numbers that that folks are using still I'll let abe answer the big number questions but you brought up meth and um, all the sheriffs in state we meet a number of times a year and we watch nationally other agencies across the country and and Jeff the issue is right now is that meth is starting to make a comeback oh really and there's a deep concern mm -hmm. that we're gonna start right back to where we were probably in the 90s late 90s in there 
and I'll let Abe talk about the other numbers that are going sure. on, maybe for our community and otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're we're seeing a, a rise in synthetic opioids, um, you know, outside of our community and our community and across the nation, as far as you know, fentanyl and things of that sort. Um, you know, as the as the prescription opioid problem increased. Um, uh, they've done a great job of trying to really mitigate some of the problems we've seen with with uh, uh, prescriptions. So there's been a rise in heroin as a result, heroin use. Um, but as the sheriff uh, indicated, uh, unfortunately meth is on the rise. It probably hasn't really subsided as much as we'd hoped originally. Uh, cocaine use is on the rise. And not only are we seeing fentanyl in, in the heroin at times, but it's also being found in meth and cocaine. So. Uh, uh, opioid uh, overdose education is important, not just for folks that are in active use using opioids, but folks that are in active use using other drugs as well, so that they have access to naloxone and are trained in overdose response. I think the thing, Jeff, it seems as though if you look back in time uh, over the decades, one thing, you kind of get a handle on it, you get that thing squished down, and the balloon pops out on the other side, and now you've got cocaine, yeah. and then you get that squished down, then you go into math, and you get that squished down, and it's just, it, you're kind of chasing this around. I, but what I, I think what was important, uh, what I drew out of that uh, commentary that he did, what I thought was outstanding, was the relationship between uh, uh, law enforcement and treatment providers. Yeah. And quite a few months ago, a long time ago, Chief Hansen started talking about medically assisted treatment. How are we going to do that? Then we get over and starts talking among the state sheriff's associations and the jails. And guess what they start talking about? We get back here and Abe saying, hey, listen, let's look at this. I just dropped an article off with Abe the other day at the National Sheriff's Magazine about medically assisted treatment. We're already moving towards that, which mm -hmm. is great for mm -hmm. what our county's doing. And um, the other piece that was involved in that, I think that people need to watch that movie from beginning to end. Because if you will draw a conclusion before you get to the end, then then you're drawing a false conclusion. Sure. Like I said last week, read the directions all the way through. Yeah. Um, as it talks about the relationship between law enforcement and and our treatment providers, and how really one without the other is not working. They have to be together. And I saw in the in the video, obviously what my side of that was on the law enforcement side was that listen we're not just actively going out there trying to arrest people just to arrest people but they, if it becomes a crime and it provides us uh, um, a more uh, a more captive audience to work with to get people involved in treatment and on that what I saw was it, uh, Seattle talking about how law enforcement now and listen to the comments the officers make on there and I think about where we're at without room and space in our jail sure and you start watching the comments that are made out of the city of Seattle and, again, scope and scale and not exactly the same thing. But I think uh, it, it's a teaching moment and a learning moment for where do we want to be in the future, uh, what it could look like. When you guys talk, uh, I know it's a lot of the fire departments, public health, sheriff, police, tribal leadership and those uh, types of groups. But do you have folks who are chemically dependent in those conversations of the 60 organizations of the 60 people that gather regularly or do you have um, lines in to the people living on the streets or in the woods to to find out what their side of better understanding all this is yeah yeah we do so uh, through through a, a couple of the programs that public health is uh, running right now we have a uh, what we call our street or backpack outreach um, a lot of that involves conversation um, relationship building, um, you know, gathering input, um, and that's also one of the benefits of the uh, program we went came on last time and talked to, talked about for the majority of the time is the substance use mobile outreach of Mason County, which includes the syringe exchange services. Mm -hmm. So we've had um, over uh, 50 people, 50 individuals access the, those resources so far, and um, that program really is built on the outreach portion of it and the relationship building and those conversations that we're having. Um, asking about you know what what is needed what what what's working for you um, what isn't working for you what what can we provide um, and we're having those same conversations with the community at large you know I think it's really important that not only are we providing these services um, but we're making sure to get the input ahead of implementing services and imp uh, before we're implementing programs that way we're being as mindful as possible and trying to find as much of a balance as possible you know working with law enforcement but also working with folks in active use mm -hmm. um, working with the court systems as well as working with schools and you know 
and so on and so on. So um, those conversations are happening, um, and uh, not just with the community, not with professionals, but with the uh, uh, family and loved ones that are in active use. Sure. I was looking at uh, our own Attorney General, Bob Ferguson, filing a lawsuit, I think it was a week ago or so, against uh, pharmaceuticals. W what's your experience with that? It's, uh, the argument is that they're shipping huge amounts of oxycodone and uh, other painkillers into the state of Washington and not complying with requirements that identify suspicious orders that could be diverted to the streets and the illegal drug market and stuff in there saying it's a huge problem. I guess Washington's just the latest state to sue some of these major opioid distributors. Is that, you guys have any experience with that? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, well, you know, I, um, I know that they had uh, talked about starting some lawsuits uh, just a couple of years ago, kind of when we yeah. started our opioid prog programs. And, um, you know, at, 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 a, at, a, at a higher level, it's, it seems to make sense. Um, you know, my hope is that um, if those lawsuits do go through and there are, there are some monies um, that are that are redistributed, that communities such as ours, rural communities that have been impacted by uh, uh, the opioid problem and the prescription opioid problem, um, that we see some of those monies that we could so we can implement programs that we're talking about for the medication mm -hmm. assisted treatment and reentry programs, things of that sort. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I know that it's. Uh, I know that a few places have been successful in in suing the pharmaceutical companies. I think companies. one of the things on that, that um, two things. That first, that, and again, I watch the show, and you're, you're talking with people that are having these issues. Um, I mentioned it last week in the meeting out there that you can bury your head in the sand and and, and hope this goes away. It's not going to. Uh, at least I don't think it is. The second thing is a lot of these things are very commingled with mental health. Not mm -hmm. everyone, but mm -hmm. very, very closely related. And on the show the other night, they said it's almost almost like 100% related. But um, it, it's very commingled. And there's not a, a first time you bring somebody in, you talk to them, and their problem is gone. Uh, th there's a lot of challenges to doing this. And I think it, it's time and time again getting the people that you can. If, if it's through, uh, if it's through intervention through law enforcement, and we get a hold of people that are going to come in and work with the people we've we've contacted, and um, that's very very important. We may see them a few times, we may see them a number of times, but each time you can get somebody out of that area, your costs start coming down. Look what it's costing yeah. Seattle. The other piece behind it on your question, I don't know about exactly what the the AG is doing. Um, all the numbers behind that, but um, I think in talking with our public health director and others that there was a time when Oxycontin was really the, the prescription to end all prescription, sure. if you want to, if you will, to uh, pain medication, and it got prescribed greatly. The one that concerned me over the years, uh, having kids or athletes and things, is the number of, of uh, high school and college athletes that had some type of an injury and were uh, uh, given this stuff and then could not get off that. And um, if you look nationwide, it was horrible. But also in the meantime, I think the medical communities also recognize that we better uh, watch this stuff and start cutting back. And I think they have. And I think uh, what the AG is working on is why do we need so much of this sure. stuff? Sure. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of money involved, I'm sure, in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But as, as you um, kind of rid this stuff down, then you're starting to see the access starting to go away. Yeah. Then you start seeing heroin. Then you start seeing meth coming back. Um, you know, there's not any one perfect answer, but I'm just really thrilled that um, uh, Abe came to us a long time ago, and then uh, Chief Bakken really has led a charge for us in his yeah. community about bringing people together. He's just done a, a superb job of getting everybody together and meeting, and that we're actually, in my opinion, uh, compared to most places when I'm reading like, articles across the nation, are saying, look what we're look what we're falling into and we're already working our way out of it. I think we're a, ahead of the game and we're going to be going to Washington, D.C. and all that able to discuss that as well uh, to, to talk to some people about what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, f through the federal funding, through the Bureau of Justice uh, grant that we received, and it's the same funding stream that Chief Bakken had received uh, recently, um, we have an opportunity to um, not just as grantees, but we're encouraged to bring community members with us, uh, other stakeholders that are involved in the discussion. And and so uh, we're looking to head over to D.C. Uh, Sheriff Sal Salisbury is a uh, agreed to go with us. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, so there'll be a group of uh, seven or eight of us. It'll kind of be a smaller representation of what uh, what our larger stakeholder group meeting is and um, discussing what's happening in rural communities. It'll be more of a pointed conversation. We'll be able to talk to our peers, um, what's, what's working, what isn't, and 
um, what do we need help with? So we're excited about that opportunity. Is it, there's kind of a true advantage to today, like Abe and I sitting here. First of all, we've known each other a long time, but in a community about our size, I can pick up the phone, I can call directly to Abe, or he can call me. Sure. And, and, and it's not that there's not that anything bad about it, but when you get into a large community, and I knew the uh, knew the sheriff up there and the former sheriffs of King County, um, they don't necessarily even know the people that you need to talk to on the ground level over at the over at the health department or whatever because it's so big. I mean, he, he, when you look at that, how many people they just hire in in a huge agency in one of those agencies, they don't even know all the people that work for them all the time, or, or see them regularly. Where here, it's fairly easy in our community to I can I can get a, a get a hold of Chief Bakken and last week we were all trying to get a time to meet and they just happened to be the same place and I was driving that direction. So I'll meet with you there. But we're in a smaller community sure. and so our communication's a little bit quicker. We can get together and yeah. sit down on these issues, and and I think that's why we're. Um, um, maybe slightly ahead of the ball game compared to where uh, and there's some other communities I'm sure our size are doing the same thing but uh, compared to the larger communities I think our, our, our reaction time and our response yeah. time is much much quicker and I think that reduces some of our problems um, but yet on the other side sometimes our resources because we're not as big we lack some of those sure. resources too so it's a balance but it's working out well for us big uh, conversation to continue to have here on the air and with the service groups uh, Mason County Sheriff Casey Salisbury Abe Gardner good to see you guys thank you, you. Well. thanks, thanks for, for coming, coming on here